Well, hello everyone. Welcome to another live stream of Let Us Reason. Uh, this is Alfadi, and with me here, our dear brother David Wood. David, welcome back, my brother. Yeah, how's it going? It's going well. Uh, as we uh, advertised uh, for this particular um, uh, basically show, we said it's going to be a talk about the top 10 myths that Muslims believe about Islam. And, um, you know, obviously this is a, a very intriguing topic. I mean, people think sometimes there are myth about Islam, but not myth that Muslims believe about Islam. So uh, we're going to start with the suggested list that uh, you've been working on, and uh, you and I will interact uh, uh, basically with that. But before we do that, uh, how has it been going, brother, and any new stuff that uh, you've been doing lately? Oh, yeah. I've been cranking out videos, usually one to two a day for uh, the past couple of weeks. By the way, am I your first super chat ever? You are my first super chat ever, bro. That's pretty cool. Yeah. So, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, Al was telling me right before uh, right before he got started that he just got the email saying he was approved. And so uh, I thought it'd be pretty cool if I jumped in there and had the first uh, first super chat on his channel ever. So that and would, we're, uh, we're that honored, would brother. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Yeah, I just uh, it, actually the, the video that I just put out uh, like maybe an hour ago, something like that actually ties in with what we're talking about. Um, I posted a video and I think it's titled a Muslim scholar warns about a coming avalanche of apostasy. So this was a, I, put, I played some clips of uh, Bilal Phillips. He's a, a convert to Islam. He's banned from multiple countries from his ties to terrorists and things like that, I guess. But uh, uh, he was warning Muslims about all, he, he, for, I mean, he's, he starts the video by just telling lots of stories of people who are leaving Islam. It's basically their, their 15 and 18 year old kids are leaving Islam. Um, the, the girls are refusing to wear the hijab. They just, they just don't want to be any part of Islam. They're saying that they don't believe in the Quran. They don't believe in Muhammad. They don't believe in Allah. And so uh, Bilal Phillips is giving his suggestions on how to fix this problem. But his response is absolute nonsense. It's more of the same, right? It's like, oh, we have to, you know, we have to get them in touch with the Quran and get them in touch with Muhammad. And that's, that's what's causing the problem. Um, so yeah, so he's, he's warning, he's warning Muslims that there's this coming avalanche. In fact, I think tomorrow I'm going to post a video because uh, you, you've seen the Hadith where Muhammad said something along the lines of there, there are various versions of it, but something along the lines of in the end times, there will come uh, young people who leave Islam faster than an arrow going out of the game. Right. So, yeah, there is uh, a lot of traditions about uh, what's going to happen at the end. And one of it is, yes, people leaving Islam. Yeah. So it's like it's like, an, you know, you shoot an arrow at an animal and then it blasts out the other side. Right. So they went into Islam, but then they just, they, you know, they, they, they shoot right out of it uh, as well. And it's funny because this is the only fulfilled prophecy of Muhammad. And they can't, and they can't use it. They can't use it because he said, when you see them, kill them. <laughs> and he said, when you see these people leaving Islam, kill them. So Muslims would love to have this as a fulfilled prophecy, but they can't because he said to kill them. Well, anyway, the, the, anyway, here, here's the, here's the issue the, 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 the reason Bilal Phillips doesn't solve this problem of this coming avalanche of apostasy, as he calls it, he calls it an avalanche and, and a tsunami of apostasy that's coming of all these Muslims that are going to be leaving Islam. The reason he doesn't really solve the problem is he doesn't understand what the problem is. The problem is that, you know, for 14 centuries, Muslims have been able to keep people in Islam through violence and intimidation. Exactly. Whereas Muslims who've moved to the West they can no longer use that violence and intimidation to the same extent. They can use it to a limited extent. They can really, you know, beat their kids and stuff like that. But uh, you know, it doesn't it doesn't work long term. And they they don't they, you don't have that massive massive amount of government controlled societal pressure that you have in Muslim countries. So they don't have that anymore. And so th in order to make up for it, they've just been relying much more heavily on deception. Right? They've gone to deception and they've spread. Islam based on myths and they've convinced Muslims, young Muslims who have doubts about Islam, they've convinced them that they need to be confident in their religion because of all these wonderful things about Islam, but they're false. They're demonstrably false. You can go to the Muslim sources and show that these things that Muslims are claiming about their religion are false. That's where you're getting this um, th that's why you're getting this avalanche of apostasy before the rise of the internet and YouTube and things like that. Right. Muslims were able to go into environments 
where there was complete ignorance about Islam and they were able to say whatever they wanted about Islam. They could say anything they wanted. If they were talking to women, it's, oh, Islam is the religion that, that champions women. If they were talking to uh, racial minorities, it's, oh, Islam is the religion of, of, of complete equality and stuff like that. They, they, could, they could adapt the message to, who, to anyone they were talking to. And that worked for a time because there was just complete ignorance about Islam. But now that we're in a position where we can challenge the deceptions, we're able to expose the myths and because the myths are being exposed, you've basically got all these young Muslims who they're excited. They start off, they're excited about Islam. They've been told about Islam. They're, they're memorizing Quran verses. They're going to Quran camps and stuff like that. And they go out and they start telling, you know, they tell their friends online, oh, Islam's wonderful. Muhammad's the greatest man who ever lived. And then it gets flipped back on. Well, why did he have sex with a little girl? Why did he take the wife of his own adopted son? Why did he do all these things? And they've never heard this before. And so they look up answers and they get some answers. And at first they think the answers are okay. So they go back and they start using their using their answers. And then they find out, whoa, even the answers that, that our Muslim apologists are giving are based on lies. And so, you know, they, they, it, it might take, sometimes it's very quick. Sometimes it's a matter of, of hours or even minutes. I've seen people leave Islam after, after rapid fire hearing information. Generally, it's not that quick though, but it might take weeks, it might take months, it might take a couple of years. But if someone is actively seeking whether these claims are true, they end up leaving Islam. And that's uh, that's Absolutely, happening more and more. Brother. It's got a lot to do with the myths that we're about to cover. Amen. And of course, I mean, uh, I praise the Lord, of course, like you said, for the social media platform. Without a doubt, it has opened a new horizon for many seekers or at least doubters. And we thank the Lord for ministries like yours, brother, and like Brother Rashid and like Sam. And uh, it's a privilege really to serve alongside of you. And let's face it also, the new platforms now, the social media is showing the youngsters, at least, uh, who are Muslims, that there are Muslims like myself who have made the decision to cross over and follow Christ, even though they are Arab, like in my case, or they know the primary sources of Islam. So all kind of things are definitely coming down and crashing on the foundation of Islam. With that mm -hmm. says, let's take a look at the top 10, starting from number 10. This mm -hmm. is one of the myths that Muslims believe about Islam. The Quran contains miraculous scientific insights. Yeah, and that's that's that was actually the first argument I was ever given for Islam. It was by a Muslim friend who was my Muslim friend even before, uh, years before I met Nabil. Um, I, had a, I had a Muslim friend who was an imam, and uh, he sat me down and showed me a video on the miraculous scientific claims uh, of the Quran. And I just remember thinking that you know there would be there would be four or five minutes of scientific explanation. Then it would give a Quran verse that didn't say any of that, but it would claim that the Quran said all that. And I was just like, really? You 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 fell for this? Um, anyway, but you know how Muslims will take these verses of the Quran, which aren't saying anything scientifically accurate, but they'll say, ah, oh, but one meaning, one meaning of the Arabic of this word is this, and this this is something that wasn't discovered until you know the 20th century and stuff like that. And uh, of course, if the scientific theory changes, then all of a sudden the, the meaning of the Quran will change. But uh, you know, exactly. you know exactly. as well as I that the 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 only clear verses of the Quran, the only verses of the Quran that are actually clearly making scientifically testable claims, are all wrong. Right? The, the Quran claims that the sun sets in a muddy pool. That's right, 18 verse 86. It, it doesn't get any clearer than that. And for Muslims who want to say no, but what it really means is that. Dual Karnain saw the sun reflect in the pool. Well, it's not what it says. It says he found the place where the sun sets. Um, but for Muslims who want to take that approach, guess what? You've got Muhammad in the Hadith. He says the same thing, and, and Dual Karnain is not there. Muhammad just asks his followers, do you know where the sun goes? They say, no, right. you know, you're the prophet. And he says, yeah, it sets in a, it sets in a pool. So you've got Allah saying that the that the Quran, I mean, the sun sits in a pool. He says that in the Quran. And then you've got Muhammad, who's supposedly the greatest interpreter of the Quran. And he says that the sun sets in a pool, confirming that the, that's what the Quran is actually saying. And so th that's just that's just silly and wrong. The, the claim that 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 stars are missiles that Allah uses to shoot at demons is know, just is just nonsense. And and if you look at what it means to be pursued by a flame of piercing brightness, when you have it explained in the Hadith, it refers to a shooting star. So there are multiple errors. One that shooting stars are actually stars. They're not. Uh, but the other is that when you see a shooting star, it's because Allah took a star and hurled it at a demon who was trying to sneak out of sneak out of uh, heaven with uh, with some with some secrets. So you have that. You have um, um, uh, semen is formed between the backbone and ribs. You've got humans go through a, a blood clot stage during embryonic exactly. development. Exactly. And the, yeah, these are the these are the clearest claims in the Quran when it comes to science. 
they're all wrong. So Muslims tell us, oh, we have to reinterpret those. We have to reinterpret those and assume that none of those mean what they say. And then you have to go to all these completely vague verses that you could give 50 different interpretations to. And you have to, you know, twist it into something that is correct and then say, you see, this is the Quran. So it's uh, it's always the same pattern in Islam. Ignore all of the clear claims because they're all false or evil. Right. And then take all these vague claims and twist them into something uh, true or good. And my goodness, this is this is a, a very, very interesting religion. But so anyway, that, that's just a myth. It, you can walk up to all kinds of Muslims and they think that the Quran contains all these miraculous scientific claims. As soon as you start getting down to show them to me and look, let's look at them. Let's go through what they say. Uh, you find out it's all just a myth. Absolutely, brother. And, you know, uh, some of them, I mean, even if they can explain away some of those, there are some that you feel like you're stuck. You cannot really uh, say anything about it. What, what's so interesting is like, you know, for instance, the idea that Dulcarnain or Alexander the Great went to the ends of the, uh, the, the world or the earth and he saw the sun sitting uh, mm -hmm. in a pool of uh, basically mud. I mean, the commentators of the Quran, the early ones, confirmed this. Mm -hmm. And there are traditions in there. So you cannot really... W uh, wiggle your way out of this so absolutely so and, what, and what, what's what's cool is i mean this is this is a this is this would be a side note is how many errors are con i mean how many problems it once you once you look at like just one of these issues how many problems arise so you've got the idea that the, the sun sets in a muddy pool that there are people who live there because that's the quran also says there are people who live there um that dual carnate that dual carnate actually reached the place um, then you've got that uh, we know who Dhul Karnain was, according to Islam. Muslims want to deny it now, but that actually refers to Alexander the Great. But it refers to Alexander the Great as a devout Muslim. Alexander the Great was the most pagan person in all of history. He definitely no, was not no, a devout Muslim. <laughs> and then in, in, a, in addition to all that, you can we can find sources of this in the Alexander romances that Muhammad was copying this story about about uh, Alexander finding the place where the sun sets. It, Muhammad copied that, and so that's five problems all in just one little passage. It, it's I mean the the level of of how wrong the Quran is is just it's just off the charts. Absolutely, let's call him problem number nine. <laughs> Uh, the Quran is a literary miracle. And, and I love this because you and I did one show one time about this, but please go ahead. Well, yeah, that's a, that's another, and this one comes from the Quran itself. The Quran claims over and over again that it's so wonderful that no one could write anything like it. And I mean, one, if, if Muslims would just think about how stupid this claim is at the very beginning, I mean, you know, one, you could point out, well, claiming that something is wonderfully written or claiming that if you can't write something like it, it must be from God is silly, right? I mean, no no one on the planet can write symphonies like Mozart. I certainly can't. That does, that, that what, what would that have to do with whether Mozart's music is inspired by God? Nothing as far as I can tell. It just means that he, has a, he was really, really awesome. So even if the Quran were this amazing literary miracle, we'd have to say, um, well, then maybe Muhammad was just a literary genius. What does that have to do with it being from God? Uh, but Muslims want to use this argument that it's 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 so amazing that it it can only it can only come from God. And notice here, even before even before actually seeing whether the the literary claim is true, we can point out problems, namely. Every time we quote the Quran to Muslims, I say, oh, no, that's not what it means. It means something else. Exactly. Right? exactly. What, what does it mean when it says smack and beat your wives into submission? Oh, it means tap them with a toothbrush. Why do you say that? That would be way better. <laughs> It'd be way better than actually saying it vaguely. That's true. That's true. What does he mean? What does he mean when he says fight those who do not believe? Oh, he means only fight in self-defense. Why didn't he say that? It would have saved millions of lives if, if he had said it like that. And so it's Muslims themselves who are telling us that Allah is the worst communicator in all of history while simultaneously claiming that the Quran is a scientific miracle. Anyway, I just wanted to read a quick quotation by the Iranian scholar Ali Dashti in his book, 23 Years. This guy spent years going through uh, examining the literary miracle of the Quran. But here's what he said. The Quran contains sentences which are incomplete and not fully intelligible without the aid of commentaries, foreign words, unfamiliar Arabic words and words used with other than the normal meaning, adjectives and verbs inflected without observance of the concords of gender and number, illogically and ungrammatically applied pronouns, which sometimes have no referent, and predicates, which in rhymed passages are often remote from the subjects. These and other such aberrations in the language have given scope to critics who deny the Quran's eloquence. 
And so, uh, what, what what do you think? Because you're 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 one of the people who read the Quran in Arabic. Are you dazzled and amazed by the amazing literary qualities of the Quran? If if so, why why haven't why have you not converted? I mean, uh, well, I left it actually, uh, and and I I read it in Arabic. So remember, Muslims sometimes will tell you, well, wait a minute. I mean, when you hear it being chanted in Arabic, that's when really the deep emotional spiritual impact will be basically felt. Well, that might be true maybe of the shorter verses, the Meccan passages, the poetic ones, but then you get to the larger passages, the Medinan one, they're just narratives. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not so sure really what is there to be impressed about, and not to mention the contradictions in it. And also, our Muslim friends tend to fail to mention this, which is the actual fact about the early Quranic manuscripts. They had no diacritical markings, no dottings. Mm -hmm. So it was open for interpretation. I, I am looking at an early manuscript of the Quran that reads certain words differently than what we have in our hand today. Mm -hmm. So that in of itself, how, do, how can you say it's eloquent or even grammatically uh, uh, pure or it's actually a literary standard when everybody can really read it according mm -hmm. to their own understanding? And yeah. as you mentioned, these days they want to reinterpret it for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have to say, Muslims who regard this as a miracle, uh, the people of Muhammad's time definitely didn't regard it as a miracle. Um, they made fun of it. Uh, when Muhammad would come out with his revelations, it's even in the Quran over and over again. They would just say, these are just fables. These are fables of the exactly. men of old. They weren't saying, oh my goodness, it's so powerful. I can't take it. It's so powerful. So people of that time weren't impressed by it. Uh, people uh, in, in modern scholars are not impressed by it. It's just a great big myth. And if you ask Muslims who insist on this, oh, it's it's a miracle. The only reason they're saying is just because they've been told it all their lives. It's not because they read the Quran and they were they were just blown away by how awesome it is. It's something that gets passed around, just like the you know just like the the claim of the scientific miracles. They're told this all their lives, and they they never bother to question it, and so they end up believing in a myth. And I guess we're here, the, we're the myth busters today. Amen. And, and brother, you've heard this, of course, I mean, about the seven hangers, you know, that it contained basically a lot of poems pre-Islam mm -hmm. and that Muhammad tend to borrow from that or the author of the Quran, at least, tend mm -hmm. to borrow from those as well. Let's go to myth number eight. Muhammad was sinless. This is my favorite one. <laughs> yeah, this is, now this is actually hilarious that Muslims think this because you just wonder, I mean, you know, they're, they're scholars and their leaders, they have to know that uh, according to the Quran itself, Muhammad is a sinner. According to the Hadith, Muhammad was a sinner. Um, where are you getting this idea that that prophets are sinless? Because they'll do this and the, they'll do this with the Bible. They'll say, oh, this story of this prophet can't be true because that would mean this this prophet, you know, sinned. It's like, where are you getting this idea that one, where are you getting the idea that prophets are sinless? Where, where are you getting that from? Um, and two, yeah, and two, I mean, if you wanted to apply to Muhammad, then great. We'd have to say he's, he wasn't a prophet because he was sinning like it was an Olympic sport. Even if we wanted to ignore the things that we would regard as sins, like him having sex with a nine-year-old girl, uh, him taking the wife of his own adopted son, even if we were to ignore those kinds of things, even according to the Quran and Hadith, Muhammad was a sinner who needed to repent. Let me go ahead and read a couple passages here. Uh, Surah 47, verse 19 of the Quran. Allah says to Allah, says to Muhammad, so know, O Muhammad, that none has the right to be worshipped but Allah, and ask forgiveness for your sin, and also for the sin of believing men and believing women. So Allah tells Muhammad to ask forgiveness for his sin. Surah 48, verses 1 to 2. Verily we have given you, O Muhammad, a manifest victory, that Allah may forgive you your sins of the past and the future, and exactly. complete his favor on you, and guide you on the straight path. So here's Allah saying, uh, I got to forgive you for your sins of the past and the future. So, well, so Muhammad's committing sins before this time and after this time. Uh, Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih al-Bukhari, 6307. So we've gone through, the, we looked at the Quran, even in the Hadith, 6307, Sahih al-Bukhari. Narrated Abu Huraira, I heard Allah's messenger saying, by Allah, I seek Allah's forgiveness and turn to him in repentance for more than 70 times a day. Muhammad needed to repent more than 70 times a day. That's like that's like every 20 minutes Muhammad needs to stop and repent from whatever he's he's doing even without sleep, right? So if you if you if you want to include sleep then he's re he's repenting like every 15 minutes. What in the world is this guy doing? You this wonder why. Yeah. 
right? I mean, didn't God tell him that I'll forgive your future sins? So why was he concerned? Yeah. And I mean, well, I, I mean, th think about it. I mean, if, if this guy, if Muhammad needs to turn to Allah and repentance every 15 minutes, one, what in the world is he doing? And two, who's he doing it to? Because that guy's a sick pervert. You know what I mean? You know, brother, anyway. what happens in Mecca stays in Mecca. I'm telling you that much. <laughs> so, <laughs> so <laughs> with, with that says, you know, this idea that there is this doctrine of Isma also that was applied yep. to all prophets. I mean, they yep. kind of like, you know, what happened is like they realized the early theologians of Islam realized that there is a problem defending Muhammad. So like they're like, OK, we're going to have an umbrella coverage now. And yep. we're going to say all of the prophets, which mm -hmm. you don't find in the Quran. But what is so interesting, David, is that the Quran emphatically mentioned that they, uh, the, our Lord Jesus Christ is sinless yep. in chapter 19, verse 19. Was it that difficult for the God of Islam to say the same thing about uh, basically uh, uh, Muhammad? Yeah, so so Muhammad Muhammad needs to run to run to Allah every fifteen to twenty minutes, uh, repenting for his sins, and the entire time we're told that Jesus was completely sinless, and then Muslims are telling us that Muhammad, who is apparently the all-time champion of sinning, um, that that he's the he's the he's the best he's the greatest man of all time, whereas the sinless man. Jesus, uh, yeah, you can just ignore what he said because his religion was corrupted. Exactly. Uh, let's go to myth number seven. Islam is anti-slavery. Is Islam anti-slavery, <laughs> Al-Fadi? <laughs> like, it's just amazing. This goes back to what I was saying earlier that um, that Muslims, when they come, when they when they when they come to the West to preach, I'm talking about you know last century when they were exactly. coming to the West to preach, they would adapt the message to whatever would be most effective with the people who were listening, and no one no, people were not in a position to correct them because people didn't have their sources, and they certainly hadn't studied sources that they didn't have access to. So Muslims would come, let's say, you know, when when uh, when Islam became popular with you know Malcolm X and Muhammad Ali, and uh, you had the Nation of Islam, but you also had Orthodox Islam, and so on. And when Islam was becoming popular in Harlem and the African American community, the message it preached was: look at what look at what Christianity does. The white the religion of white people. It enslaves the black man, but Islam liberates people. Islam is against slavery. Our prophet was against slavery. And so they they preached that message and tons of people converted because we just have a tendency to think that when people are telling us about their religion, they're telling us what's true. They don't realize that there is one religion that will just openly lie to you in order to get you to convert. And that is, that is Islam. And so what happened was people just weren't in a position to correct the errors, to correct the, the mistakes. They didn't have the sources. Now, all of a sudden, here we are a few decades later, and we have the sources and we can read about Muhammad buying, owning, selling, and trading black African slaves, but exactly. Muhammad being the whitest person on the planet, about Muhammad having sex with his slave girls. All the stuff that is most horrifying to us is true of Muhammad. And yet his preachers in the 20th century were going around proclaiming that this is the religion that that, that liberates slaves and so on. It's absolute nonsense. Let's just read a couple of uh, quick passages here. So Hayal Bukhari, 7263, narrated Umar. I went to the house of the prophet and behold, Allah's messenger was staying in a mashrubah and a black slave of Allah's messenger was at the top of the stairs. I said to him, tell the prophet that here is Umar bin al-Khattab. Then he admitted me. Notice a black slave. They're just describing these slaves as black slaves of Muhammad. So he was his favorite color, by the way. Yeah. When it comes to judgment and everything else. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, Sahih al-Bukhari 6161 narrated Anas bin Malik, Allah's messenger was on a journey and he had a black slave called Anjasha and he was driving the camels very fast and there were women riding on those camels. Allah's messenger said, why haka, O Anjasha, drive slowly the camels with the glass vessels, i.e. the women. So you have passage after passage after passage of the uh, about Muhammad and his slaves in provisions of the afterlife. Um we have 28 of Muhammad's male slaves listed by name and 12 of Muhammad's female slaves. So it's just amazing that, you know, just a few decades ago and, and still now, I mean, people are still going around. You, you can walk up to a Muslim now and they'll say, oh, Muhammad was the one who, who abolished slavery and, and uh, freed the slaves. Oh, yeah, fact, no and, yeah, as a matter of fact, people who should know better and, and at, it's absolutely, they, they have to know better. People like Reza Aslan, 
Raza Aslan, who writes books on Muhammad, he's obviously read the sources. He was in a uh, he was in a, a discussion with Sam Harris, I think, and Sam Harris was bringing up the, the problem of slavery. And Reza Aslan said, "Well, if you knew anything about Islam, you would know that the first thing that Muhammad did." When he became a prophet, was to abolish slavery. Like you, that is either you. You either know you're lying, or, or you don't know anything, or yeah. you're, or you've never studied anything. Because all exactly. you you find over and over and over again, Muhammad buying slaves, selling slaves, trading slaves, uh, trading slaves for other slaves, having sex with his slaves, telling his followers they can have sex I, with their slaves. Where are you getting this? And you, what do, what do, what does a Muslim? Apologist tell them tell his audience Muhammad abolished slavery and people go oh wow what a wonderful religion he's spreading a myth right that's all a myth absolutely and also David I mean what is the purpose then of chapter four verse three that talks about you're allowed to have yeah. a wa uh, what your right hand possess slavery basically a slave maid what is the purpose of four twenty four that allows mm -hmm. you to sleep with her. Uh, mm -hmm. What is the purpose of basically uh, chapter 65, verse 4, uh, that talks about, you know, you sleep even uh, with young, uh, basically, uh, women. And, of course, in chapter 4, talks about sleeping with those, even if they're married, by the way. The fact that they're your slave now, then you can sleep with them. Mm -hmm. Not only you're sleeping with a slave and having slavery, you're even committing adultery on top of that. Yep. Yeah, it's pretty rough yep. stuff. Especially, I mean, yeah, 424, I encourage people to read the Hadith. The hadiths that are associated with Surah 4, verse 24, because you can't understand. It's one of those verses that you won't understand how evil it is without looking at the historical background. The background of Surah 4, verse 24, is that Muslims um, conquered an area, and in the past they had conquered areas and they killed the men and taken the and they took the women captive, and they know that they were allowed to have sex with the female captives that had already been revealed. Right. But this time they captured the men and the women. They captured the men and the women. They captured the husbands and the wives. And so the Muslims weren't sure that they were allowed to have sex with the women because the women were still married. The women were still married. And therefore, wouldn't it be adultery? And so they went to Muhammad. Muhammad, what's going on? That's when Allah reveals Surah 4, verse 24 of the Quran. Yes, married women are forbidden to you, except the captives of your right hand, those that you're, the, the, the captives that you've captured. So if, if you have sex with a married woman, yeah, it's generally wrong. Unless you've captured them, then it's okay to have sex with a married woman. Even though her husband's still right there, she's married, you can still have sex with her because you captured her. And so this is you know, uh, it's, it's just, it's just, it's just, in, it's just insane to think that absolutely. this is a religion that's against that. And, and David, what, why in the world would you lust after a woman that you know she's married and her husband is with her? What, what kind of a religion would teaches you to do something like this? And why do you even need to go and ask mm -hmm. about something like this? I thought Islam was a religion of peace, right? And harmony and uh, mm -hmm. all kind of stuff. That's what they keep telling us. <laughs> Until we get to uh, myth number six, the Quran contains no contradictions. There you go. Yeah. So... Um... I'll just I'll just I'll just give a quick summary of, of verses here. So people I'll give the references and people can go ahead and, and look them up and take a closer look. But, uh, you know, the, the Quran claims to be free from error and contradiction and Muslims, they go to the Bible and they'll take these passages that are written centuries apart on different continents by completely different people in different historical situations, they'll say, you see right here, these are these are saying different things. And if, if those are contradictions, then gosh, we have to have a pretty uh, uh, pretty similar standard when we approach the Quran because that's that's supposedly all revealed to one guy, all written by Allah, and it's all perfectly clear. So if we start finding problems here, then yeah. we can't just sweep those under the rug. So I'll give people some references they can check out. Um, how long did it take Allah to create the universe? According to Surah 7, verse 54, it took six days. According to Surah 41, verses 9 to 12, it took eight days. What did Allah create first, the heavens or the earth? Make sure you get a good translation on this one because there, there are translations that will try to cover it up. Uh, but which, what did Allah create first, heavens or the earth? So you don't, keep in mind, there are only three possibilities. Either he created the heavens, then the earth, or he created the earth, then the heavens, or he created both at the exact same time. Those are the possibilities. Right. But if you go to the Quran, according to Surah 2, verse 29, the earth was created first, then the heavens. According to Surah 79, verses 27 to 30, the heavens were created first, then the earth. So what, which, whatever is correct, the Quran gets it wrong in another place. Who was the first Muslim? Surah 6, verse 14 says that Muhammad was the first Muslim. Surah 7, verse 143 says that Moses was the first Muslim. And yet the Quran also declares that Adam and Abraham were Muslims. 
The Quran tells us in Surah 10, verse 47, that Allah has sent a messenger to every nation. Every nation has received a messenger. Quran tells us in Surah 2, verses 125 to 129, that Abraham and, and Ishmael came to Arabia. They came to Arabia. They built the Kaaba. Muslims believe this. And yet in Surah 28, verse 46, Muhammad was the first messenger to come to the Arabs. How is he the first messenger to come to the Arabs when Abraham and Ishmael came there, set up worship, and uh, had that worship faithfully preserved, at least in their practices, all the way down to the time of Muhammad? According to Surah 4, verse 48 of the Quran, committing shirk, the sin of shirk, is unforgivable. Later in the same Surah, verse 153, Allah forgives people for committing shirk. Surah 16, verse 103, tells us that the Quran is written in pure Arabic, and yet there are tons of foreign words in the Quran. Surah 2, verse 62, says that Jews and Christians don't need to fear because we'll be accepted by Allah. Surah 3, verse 85, says that the only religion accepted by Allah is Islam. Um, what about intercession? Will intercession be accepted on the day of judgment? According to Surah 2, uh, according to Surah 20, verse 109, Surah 34, verse 23, Surah 43, verse 86, yes, interception will be will be accepted. According to Surah 2, verse 123, Surah 6, verse 51, and Surah 82, verse 19, no, intercession will not be accepted. And finally, uh, just, just think about what the Quran says about the creation of man. What is man created from? Oh, dear Lord. Surah 19, verse 67, says that man was created from nothing. Yeah. Surah 98 and Surah 96, verse 2, says that man was created from a clot of blood. Surah 21, verse 30, says that man was created from water. Surah 16, verse 4, says that man was created from a small seed. Surah 15, verse 26, says that man was created from clay and mud. Surah 3, verse 59, says that man was created from dust. Surah 11, verse 61, says that man was created from earth. Now, you can reconcile some of these. I mean, just, just on that last example, you can reconcile some of these. You can say that when it says, you know, it's created from a, uh, you know, from a, a blood or a clot or something like that, that's talking about during embryonic development, still false, but uh, you could say that. And, and then when, when it's talking about, you know, creating man at the beginning, then it's, you know, creating him out of, out of dust or something like that. But you, you can what only do, you, do, you can only do so much with that. What do you do with he's created from dust and he's created from water? Those are those are opposite things. Dust is is dry and and water is wet. And what do you do when he says it's created from nothing? Man's created from exactly. nothing, nothing, and man's exactly. created from all these different things. And so it's like no matter what no matter what you say, you're being contradicted by your own Quran. Yep. And, and you know, in the spirit of Ramadan, by the way, David, I'm going to give another contradiction. If uh, Muslims would want to go to chapter two of the Quran, verses 183 and 184, or 184 and 185, depending on the uh, basically uh, the readings that they have, uh, one verse says that uh, the fasting is mandatory. Uh, uh, I should say voluntary. The next verse said it's mandatory. Right there, next to each other. By the way, that's one contradiction. Number two, Warsh, for instance, reads that if you uh, cannot fast for whatever reason, you can feed poor people more than three or more i should say when it comes to the current reading by huffs the 1924 for instance cairo edition it says you feed one poor person well you know david this is a religion of works do you feed mm -hmm. one or do you feed three or more i mean it's all about piling up the good deeds man i mm -hmm. mean so which one is it voluntary or is it mandatory i can tell you Probably more than fifty percent of Muslims would like to stay home and eat right now, man. I mean, if this, uh, if it is not uh, mandatory. Mm -hmm. yep. So, there you go. But of course, of course, David, I cannot believe you say that there are contradictions in the Quran. Yep. We'll forgive you for that. Myth number five: Islam is a religion of peace. Okay, well, this this is a whole episode now. <laughs> yeah, well, well, we'll we'll keep it we'll keep it short. But you know, after every terrorist attack carried out in the name of Allah by his followers screaming Allahu Akbar, we're told that this this has nothing to do with Islam because Islam is a religion of peace. And what they'll do to show this is they'll completely distort the meaning of verses, or they'll go to verses that have been abrogated by later verses. So in a nutshell, what you have, ladies and gentlemen, this is true whether you go to the Quran, whether you go to the Hadith, whether you go to the Sirah, whether you go to the Tafsir, it's basically the rules changed depending on the situation that Muhammad was in. When Muhammad's just this totally outnumbered, persecuted prophet in Mecca, the message was 
yeah, we could have our disagreements, but let's not attack each other because you know Allah will judge us in the future. So to you be our religion and to me be my religion. Later, later, when Muhammad had formed alliances with various tribes and he had a number of, uh, he had far more followers, then the message changed to Muslims can fight, but only defensively. If someone attacks the Muslim community or someone's oppressing them, or even if someone's just, just really insulting Muhammad or something like that, Muslims could retaliate with violence. So many Muslims will go to these passages and say, you see, it's just fighting in self-defense. What's wrong with that? Well, what's wrong with that is the message of Islam keeps changing depending on the status of Muslims in a society. And those revelations weren't the end either. The final marching orders are found in Surah 9, which was the last major chapter of the Quran revealed. And that's where you find commands to fight people based on what they believe. Surah 9, verse 29, fight those who do not believe in Allah. Now you're getting now exactly. you're getting commands not to fight people who are oppressing you. You're getting commands to fight people based on what they believe. And that's exactly how Muhammad interpreted those commands, because he says in the Hadith, I've been commanded to fight people until they say there is no God but Allah, but Allah and Muhammad is the messenger. Of Allah. So Muhammad says he's being commanded to fight people based on what they believe. Allah says he's commanding people uh, to fight based uh, based on their beliefs. You have Muhammad saying that he's he's been made victorious with terror. So terror is his is his method, and he's got a religion that he that claims that this is going to keep happening. It's going to keep expanding until Muhammad was supposedly shown in a vision. He's seen the entire world and that it was all dominated by Islam. And so Muslims have been commanded to literally subjugate the entire world violently. That is precisely the opposite of what a religion of peace would be. And so when Muslims, Muslims, when you, when you hear these verses, when you hear, oh, the Quran says, that if anyone kills a man, it's as if he's killed all mankind. My goodness, read the verse, and especially the next verse. What the verse actually says, and you can go read it, Surah 5, verse 32 of the Quran, go read it, please read it. It says that this was for the Jews. <laughs> it was a revelation to the Jews. The very next verse is the command to Muslims, and it starts telling Muslims to go on a mass killing spree for the people who make mischief in Muslim lands. It's a bloodbath in the next verse, talking about crucifying people, killing people, executing people. Uh, so read these verses, read these verses, and maybe you won't get embarrassed when we keep exposing the myths of your religion. Amen, brother. And not only, I mean, it's, it's kind of interesting when, when you mention 929, for instance, and fight those uh, uh, who do not believe in Allah or, you know, uh, the day of judgment and so on and so forth, and speaking specifically about the Christians and the Jews, the people of the book. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a contradiction also in the Quran when they, they, they keep claiming to us in chapter 2, verse 256, that there is no compulsion in mm -hmm. religion? I mean, right no. there, you see that. By the way, didn't you do just recently a video about what happened in Afghanistan, I think? Uh, yeah, there, there's all kinds of horrible stuff going on, Afghanistan, Pakistan, but yeah, in Afghanistan, they, the jihadis attacked a maternity ward at a hospital. And so, yeah, is this um, a religion of peace, you know, it, that attacks a maternity, uh, basically ward killing in, uh, innocent babies? It, it must be a religion of peace because that's what his, his followers call it. And that's what lots of politicians, uh, also call it. So it must be. Well, let's move on brother. Um, myth number four. Islam is pure monotheism. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a lot of fun right yeah. here. Yeah, I just, I mean, this is just a kind of, it's a kind of situation where, where Muslims just, they say, it's because they're told that their religion is pure monotheism, that they really think it is, when if any other religion on the planet were doing the same things that Muslims did, they would immediately say, what is this pagan nonsense? If anyone was doing this, they would they would immediately recognize it, right? If Muslims, so let, let me give you an example. So start with the obvious, right? You've got that they they all bow down to this giant uh, cube, and then they 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 rush to to kiss this black stone on the side of the on the side of the cube. I was right? one of them. I was yeah. one of them. Yeah. So you've got they they all bow down to this big cube. And if you ask them, why are you bowing down to this big cube? I mean, was, and they'll say, ah, but you know, the Jews also bow down facing the temple. Yeah, but the Jews believe that the presence of God filled the temple. That God's presence filled it. The, they're not bowing down to the temple. They're bowing down to God exactly. who fills the temple. You Muslims don't believe that. You don't believe that Allah, you know, comes down and fills the temple. So what are you doing bowing down to a cube? And so the next answer will be, oh, it's just a direction of prayer. Here's what's amazing. You could put anything else. You could put anything else there. 
and they would immediately see the problem, right? L like if I said, everyone, we have to bow down to this, uh, you know, shotgun mic. Everyone, we all have to bow down to this microphone. And I put this down and everyone starts bowing down to the microphone. Oh, we're bowing down to the microphone. Uh, and if someone were to come along and say, what sort of pagan nonsense is this? You're all bowing down to a microphone. I said, I imagine saying, ah, no, that, that microphone's just the direction that we're all praying. Well, why? Why are you why are you praying facing that? Why are you why? What, what is the purpose of praying facing that thing? Well, we're just we're just told to. Muslims would immediately if Muslims saw anyone bowing down to something, right? Facing a microphone, a pencil, an iPhone, they would immediately think, look at this pagan religion bowing down to this thing. But since they're Muslims, they 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 have no problem with it. And then you've got the black stone and they're rushing to kiss this thing. What are you doing kissing this rock? Exactly. By the, by the way, according to the Hadith, that rock is actually going to uh, show that it's alive on the judgment day, and it's going to testify on whether you kissed it properly and so on. That's so right. That's it right. is actually this conscious rock that is keeping records of the things that you're doing. If this were any other religion, and they said, and, and they said, hey, we've got this rock that we, we, you know, we rush to kiss and so on, Muslims would immediately recognize it as paganism. In fact, in the Bible, Hezekiah, when it said he wanted to do what was right in the, the eyes of the Lord, he smashed the pagan stones. He smashed all the rocks that people were 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 using as their worship. So, in, according to the Bible, you you smash pagan, you smash rocks. If people are if people are, are treating them with reverence, you smash those things. And yet we find Muhammad making it a center of his worship. So you have all kinds of things like that. Um, we can do we can do lots of shows on this, but I just want to what what I just want to point out is uh, is. Uh, something Anthony and I were, were talking about um, last night. Now, now, obviously, you have things like Muhammad, where Muslims clearly and indisputably attribute to Muhammad things that they they should not be attributing to a mere human being. So they have, you know, you can say anything you want about God. As soon as you say it about Muhammad, someone has to die. You can... You, you can say, you can put all kinds of pictures up about Jesus. No one comes to kill you. As soon as you make a picture of Muhammad, then someone has to die. They're clearly, clearly doing things with Muhammad, such as talking directly to him in their prayers that they should not be doing with any mere human being. For you Muslims are saying, no, you, no, we don't do that. Yes, you do. You, you say, peace be upon you, O prophet. There's a massive difference between saying, peace be upon you, O prophet, in the context of your prayers, there's a massive difference between that and then, you know, and something like saying, God, please bless Muhammad, right? If I say, God, please bless my grandma, I'm talking to God about my grandma. If I say, God bless you, grandma, my grandma better be there because otherwise, if I'm saying that during my prayers, then I'm speaking directly to grandma during my prayers. So anyway, there's a lot of weird stuff going on here. But uh, one thing you'll find is that Islam has a kind of, uh, I would call it replacement paganism, where Muhammad takes things that the pagans had as part of their religion exactly. and worship, and then he gives them an, an Islamic replacement, and they do the same thing, and it might even be more pagan, but he'll just call it uh, pure monotheism. It's, it's somehow pure tawhid, right? So as an example, um, the story of the satanic verses, where Muhammad gets a revelation saying that Muslims can pray to Alat, Alus, and Manat, because these were pagan goddesses, right. and he calls them the exalted cranes. The exalt, they're these birds, right? They're these bird goddesses. And the reason it's okay to pray to them is because it says they're they're your intercessors. So you talk to the goddesses, and then the goddesses, the bird goddesses, will fly to Allah and share your requests with Allah. So notice there's Allah, and then there's you, and then you have these birds inter as intercessors, but uh, for you, flying between you and God. Any Muslim in the history of forever can look at that and say that is absolute, indisputable, pagan, polytheistic nonsense, right? And so the story of the satanic verses, Muhammad delivered that revelation, but then he came back and said the devil tricked him into doing it. And, the, and, exactly. and, and Gabriel- and a whole different problem right yeah, there. Yeah, and uh, so so he'd been corrected, but, he, but here's what's interesting. In the Hadith, Muhammad said that uh, when the judgment comes, chapters of the Quran are going to appear as flocks of birds to intercede for Muslims. And they've been keeping records. These flocks of birds have been keeping records on how much you, uh, how much you recite them and so on. And they're conscious, they have memories, and they're going to fly between you and Allah to intercede for you. Now think about this. This is Muhammad speaking. But he makes it the Quran, chapters of the Quran, which fly between you and Allah as these flocks of birds. 
That's Muhammad speaking. Right, right, That's right. Muhammad speaking, but somehow, since he says, nope, it's Islam and it's pure monotheism, then all of a sudden, having these thing, having these birds fly between you and God as your intercessors, suddenly it's not paganism. Guys, it's the exact same thing that Allah, Alusa, and Manat were doing, but, uh, but Muhammad includes it, and he just says, yeah, but it's chapters of the Quran. Muslims go, oh, it's chapters of the Quran. What is it? It's still these conscious, personal beings who are flying between you and Allah to intercede for you. He takes the, the pagan nonsense of the polytheistic right. pagans. He gives it an Islamic uh, an Islamic replacement. It does the same exact thing, but it's pure monotheism and the pure worship of, of, the, of the one true God. What sort of pagan nonsense is this? He's taking all the paganism of, of, uh, of, the, of the polytheists of Mecca and he's giving it an Islamic alternative. And then Muslims look at it and they say, yep, we just don't see it's, it. All we see is pure monotheism here. What a myth. Absolutely. And a simple reading of the tradition about the uh, uh, satanic verses, you'll come across, you know, Al-Tabari's account uh, and others as well, and Ibn Ishaq, and you'll see that Muhammad actually bowed down. Mm -hmm. I mean, wasn't there idols when he bowed down? So he was bound down to idols. And also on top of this, when he moved to Medina and supposedly he received this revelation to change the direction of prayer from Jerusalem towards Mecca, he kept praying like this for a couple of years. Weren't these idols also in this Kaaba? And also, brother, you look at the, uh, you know, the Islamic, basically, pillars of Islam, I should say, the five pillars. The first one, the Shahada, aren't you invoking Muhammad next to Allah in order for you to become a Muslim? Isn't that shirk? The yeah, prayer. The, we matter of fact, the, it. The, yeah. first, the first person I ever heard who called that shirk was a Quran only Muslim, right? Muslim who who rejects the hadith. And he was telling me that he only believes in the Quran. I was thinking, wait a minute, they have a they have a kind of shahada in the Quran, but it's just that you know that there's only Allah, right? They don't have the full Islamic creed. There's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. So I asked him, I said, wait, you don't recite the Shahada? And he goes, No, it's shirk. You can't put you can't put Muhammad right beside Allah in, in, in your in your creed of how you would how you would you submit go. to God. Yeah. There you go. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, so the first pillar, the second pillar of the prayer, we just talked about it. And then you have the fifth pillar, the pilgrimage. I mean, why do they go and stone pillars? I mean, isn't mm -hmm. that also another form of idolatry? Brother, I mean, it's interesting how I used to believe in all of this and think wholeheartedly that it is really religious. And now I look back at it and say, man, it was paganism all over. It's I obvious, mean, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Again, a shout out to those uh, who are doing the super, uh, uh, basically, uh, chat. Thank you so much. Super stickers. Thank you for all of you for being here. Thank you for the mo moderators. Uh, we're going through a series myself here, uh, a, a list, I should say, uh, me and David Wood called the 10 uh, is a myth that Muslims believe about Islam. And we're down to number three right now, uh, which says that Islam promotes women's rights. Oh, boy. Oh dear. yeah, yeah, guys. Just a reminder for those who came in late. This was the I'm the one who mentioned that that uh, that uh, that Al Fadi now had super chats because he just got approved today. So uh, if you came in late, this is the first day that Al Fadi is able to have uh, accept super chats on his channel. So if you get a chance and things are going okay for you during the coronavirus, then make sure he has a good, awesome first day of super chats. Um, if 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 you're if you're short, if you're a little short and things are going rough because the coronavirus stuff, do not support us, right? Do not support us. They're they're different, right. you know. Christians are a, a body around the world, and when when Amen. when when one part's doing well, you support the other parts. Um, all right, so <laughs> Islam supports women's rights, right? Now yeah. you, you could say that it supports women's rights in certain way. It says you know it, it says that Muslims you know Muslims are supposed to feed their wives that's the agreement you get to use her private parts and um and she has to obey you but you know you have to feed her and stuff like that so you have you have some you have some some examples of Islam supporting women's rights but there, there's a problem um there are all kinds of organizations that study um what's called the gender gap in the world so the the gap between the rights of of men and women ar around the world you know there's the, the World Economic Forum and so on and every one of these studies, every one of these studies, every one of these groups that studies the gap between the rights of, of men and women in countries or the difference between what men and women are allowed to do in different countries, uh, they all have some horrifying results. So, so what we're talking about in these kinds of situations are, uh, you know, how far can a girl go in her education versus how far can a man go? How much, uh, what what jobs can a woman have versus what jobs can a man have? Uh, in court, 
is one side favored over the other. These are the kinds of things that, that they look at. And wherever they do these studies, they find out that uh, that 11 out of the top 12 or 18 out of the top 20 of the worst places in the world are Muslim majority countries, right? There's always, this is always the pattern. It will be nine out of 10, 11 out of 12, 18 out of 20. The overwhelming majority of the worst places in the world to be a woman are Muslim majority countries. And you'd, so at the very least, you'd have to start wondering why. But then you exactly. go to the Muslim sources and you find out that women are stupid and immoral. Their testimony is worth half that as a man. Uh, a, a man has, uh, is, is his wife is his tilth, according to the Quran. She's a tilth, meaning a field for you to plow. And so, so plow her however you want. Um, you can smack and beat them. You can beat women into submission. And according to this Muslim source, you can beat them until their skin turns green. You hear Muslims why, why, do, why do you beat them, brother, in chapter 434? What's the if, reason behind that? If you, yeah, if you fear rebellion, right? You, says, you just think something yeah, happened. That's, that's why Muhammad said a man will not be asked as to why he beat his wife. It's none of your business. She doesn't have to actually do anything against you. If you simply think that she's done something against you, uh, you, can, you can beat her so that she never does what you think she might do. And so you, you have all of these, these kinds of problems that men could, could hire prostitutes, that men can uh, have sex with prepubescent girl, that girls, that men can uh, take women captive and rape them, even if their husbands are still around, even if they're married. Uh, and you just it's just a massive disaster for women. It's right. the, Muslim majority countries to this day are among the worst places in the world to be women. But amazingly, Muslim preachers come to the West and their 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 target audience in in many cases is women and they say you know you like you like women's rights muhammad was the champion the all-time champion of women's rights he's the greatest thing that ever happened to women in the history of humanity and it just goes back to muslims spreading myths in order to propagate their religion absolutely brother and uh, to all of you by the way i'm gonna have sister khadija who shared her testimony a couple of weeks ago with us again in another live stream this coming Sunday at 6 p.m. New York Times, 11 p.m. London time to talk about what? Women rights. Because she, who's better equipped to talk about women rights in Islam other than a former Muslim who is a female who lived Islam and it been exposed to all these supposed rights. Well, brother, we're down to two. Uh, basically, good job. Great job. You're doing awesome. Uh, myth number two, Islam is spreading rapidly due to the rate of convergence, basically. You hear this all the time. Yeah, conversions, right? And we get this, I get this dozens of times per day. Muslims say, uh, if Islam is false, then uh, why are so many people accepting it so that's the fastest religion in the world? Notice they're connecting Islam being the fastest growing religion with people accepting Islam as the truth and people converting to it. Um, it's amazing because if you say, how do you know that Islam is the fastest growing religion? They point to a Pew Research study which says that Islam is the world's fastest growing religion. But Pure in that research. same, yeah, in that same research study, in the same research study, it says that why Islam is growing rapidly. And it's wherever you go, Muslims have the highest birth rates. Muslims have the highest birth rates everywhere in the Middle East, in Europe, in Africa, Muslims have the highest birth rates. And basically, if, if, women and girls in your religion are having way more babies than everyone else, then your religion spreads if you're teaching your children your religion. And so Islam is growing. It's just not growing due to conversions. In a place like the United States, the number of people converting to Islam is offset by the number of people leaving Islam. So Islam isn't growing at all in the United States based on conversions. Um, in, in Islam is growing because of high birth rates. What's interesting is once you look into why Islam has the highest birth rates, it's because the point we just addressed, Islam's impact on women, if women don't have access to the same education and careers and everything else, and you're allowed to marry them off when they're young girls, then by the time a woman has had her first child in the United States at like age 24 or 25, her Muslim counterpart in Yemen ha is on baby number eight. You know what I mean? And so that's how Islam is spreading. So notice, what if Muslims were to really state the argument accurately, they would have to say, um, Islam must be the truth because it has such a horrible impact on women that it, it basically 
transforms women into baby making machines who are married off at a young age, have nothing else to do in life, but, but have lots of babies. And they have the most babies and therefore Islam spreads and therefore it must be the truth because of this horrible impact it has on women. If that's your main argument for your religion, Muslims, uh, you probably need a new religion. Absolutely, brother, and I, I like what you're what you're uh, saying here about that. And not to mention, brother, of course. I mean, I, I love it when we talked about this before uh, at the, the studio, and you mentioned also atheism is growing. Uh, mm -hmm. Hinduism has been around for a long time and has many followers. Well, I mean, I don't understand uh, this fixation on yeah. quantities, you know. And well, also, yeah, isn't it Muslims, David, that tell me that I wasn't a Muslim at all just because I left Islam? So apparently, I was a fake Muslim. So how many yeah. fake Muslims are out there right now? Yeah, and uh, yeah, and it's it's just silly. I mean, it, it's it's basically anything that they can point to Islam for. They'll say that this is the proof of Islam. Well, like Christianity is the world's largest religion. Well, why don't Muslims say? I mean, no. Imagine Christians walking around. Christianity must be true because it's the biggest religion. It, it would never occur to us to use a, an argument like that because we have much better arguments for Christianity. But in Islam, where you just you got you're scraping the bottom of the barrel. They just gonna have to go with what they got, and so if, if they read a research study and says this religion is growing rapidly because of uh, because of birth rate high birth rates in third world countries, um, they'll latch onto that. They'll twist they'll twist it and say it's because of conversions, and then they'll say surely this religion must be true because of all the people converting to it. Yep, and and we know that there is a lot of Muslims are leaving Islam, isn't it mm -hmm. uh, true that you just mentioned earlier yeah, that you know there is this panic basically uh, mode about why Muslims avalanche are avalanche. Exactly. Now, uh, myth number one, drum rolls. Are you guys ready? No. There we go. <laughs> uh, the Quran has been perfectly preserved. Yeah. So every, every Muslim, this is, this is number one, because it's, it's every Muslim you run into will say that the Quran has been perfectly preserved right down to the letter. And it's something that would literally take you five minutes of actual research to see is demonstrably false. So, uh, I've got entire videos and entire live streams on this. Let's keep it quick so that this live stream actually sticks to an hour to cover 10 points. But brief rundown here. Uh, according to the Muslim sources, entire chapters of the Quran were lost because Muslims were too exactly. lazy to recite them. That's Abu Musa in Sahih Muslim 22. 86. You can read it. It's right there. He says that they that they they forgot entire chapters of the Quran, and he warns the reciters not to become lazy in reciting. You've got large passages that came up missing. Aisha said that more than a hundred verses were lost just from Surah 33 alone. More than a hundred verses were lost. Um, you've got you've got Aisha in Sunan Ibn Majah 1944 saying that uh, verses where she had the only copy, those 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 copies were eaten, the, the one copy was eaten by a sheep, and now those verses are no longer in the Quran. You, you have this over and over again in the Muslim sources, verses that, according to the Hadith, are supposed to be in the Quran. You can't find them in the Quran. Why? Because they were lost or they were eaten by a sheep. And so even if you ignore the manuscript differences and things like that, if you just look at the Muslim sources, you find that Muhammad's own closest companions couldn't agree on which chapters were supposed to be in the Quran. If you went to Ibn Masud, his Quran had 111 chapters. He said Surah 1, Surah 113, and Surah 114 aren't supposed to be in the Quran. If you go to Ubay ibn Ka if you go to Ubay ibn Kab's Ka Quran, more. yeah, he has two additional chapters. He's got all, he's got all the chapters you got, but two additional ones, right? And so these are the things that you find in the history of Islam. I mean, by the time you get to Uthman, who's the third of the rightly guided caliphs, he has to order everyone to hand over the Qurans so he can burn them all to cover up all the differences. And we look at this, and Muslims Muslims say perfect preservation right down to the letter. And it's just on the level of absolute insanity that this is an argument that Muslims believe in. And that's why we call it a myth. And that's why we're exposing it. And that's why once these myths are all exposed, you are going to have a genuine avalanche of apostasy, just as Bilal Phillips has predicted. Amen, brother. And uh, we have Rami MT says he is uh, considering himself to be a fake Muslim now because he left Islam technically, but he's not following any religion. But Rami, we're not asking anyone to follow religion. We want you to consider following our Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He's not about religion, by the way. And speaking of that, of course, brother, I mean, I'm doing my studies right now in early Quranic manuscripts. And the idea that the Quran is preserved is just something that I tell people, please don't go that route. Yeah. You know, do not go that route. You can watch uh, David's videos on that. You can watch my video series with Jay Smith. We've done 
multiple ones on this, even get the book that is called uh, uh, 20 Example of Correction in Early Crime Manuscript. It shows you clearly the corrections that were done there. Brother, thank you so much. You've mm -hmm. done a great job in one hour. I mean, I, I kudos to you. I didn't know if we're going to finish the top 10 or not. Maybe we can come up with another top 10 of something. Oh, in we come up with all kinds of top 10s. So <laughs> thank you for being with us. And thank you, everyone, for uh, being uh, uh, with us uh, on this live stream. Of course, you know how to get a hold of our brother, Act 17 Apologetics. That's the name of his channel. Subscribe to it. If you have not done so, you can subscribe to ours also, Sierra International. Thank you again for the super shadows and the sticker. And uh, thank you for our moderators. You've done a great job. Thank you for everyone who joined us. And thank you to our great guest here, David Wood. Until we meet again, have a blessed day. Take care, everybody.